First of all, I would like to welcome you all from wherever you are in the world. And I would also like to gratefully acknowledge that I observe and work on the unceded lands of the Seashell First Nation. Now, what I want to talk about tonight is outreach. And I mean way outside your center. This picture is actually taken at the mouth of Narrows Inlet. That's a couple of my astronomer friends. That's my telescope between them there. And this is a water access only place on Seashell Inlet that we went up to to do a presentation for some university types from Saskatchewan who are visiting a resort there. And you may think, well, okay, that's out there. That isn't quite as far as I'm thinking. Now, I know you've got a observatory and that you use the uh, observatory at SFU with your center, and we have an observatory as well. We know you do all kinds of outreach, just like we do. What I'm talking about is this place and places like it. And we'll get back to this in a moment. This is why Brian Elliott is with us tonight, because he went to this location. Now, Louis Pasteur once said, chance favors only the prepared mind. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind if you want to do outreach, because a lot of this has to do with seizing opportunities that come along. For example, this lady here is Dr. Shireen el -Baradai. She's with the German University in Cairo, in Egypt. And she contacted us because she was interested in becoming a member of the RASC. And of course, there's no problem with that at all. We already have members from all over the world. So she joined us, no problem. But then she said, I have a number of colleagues who would also like to be part of this. And we'd like to create a center in Egypt. Now, the reason she's interested. She's a hydrologist at this university, but she's interested in icy asteroids as well. So this is where the astronomy angle comes in. So we're definitely looking into right now the opportunity of, of creating a center in another country. It's a matter of looking at their laws and ours and seeing whether there's any adjustments need to be made to our constitution to do that. But it's something we're pursuing. And the reason we're interested in that, just in case you were wondering, is because of this. There's going to be a total eclipse right over this place, which is Luxor, Egypt, in 2027. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had an RESC center then at that time? Okay. Let's go even further out. This is Uganda. And that little pin that you see on the map there, that red pin, that's Kibali. And Kibali is walking distance from the equator. Now, one of the members of my center, Dr. Brian Lucas, is a retired anesthesiologist, and he goes there to teach medicine. And he was talking to a nurse at the hospital who said, will you talk to my son? He wants to be an astronomer. I want him to be a doctor. Could you talk him out of that? Well, he ended up talking to him and became very quickly convinced that her son absolutely does want to be an astronomer. This is him here, Harry and Edith. So when Brian came home, he said, would you be his pen pal? I said, absolutely. And I spoke to him for a couple of weeks back and forth on email and on Zoom. And then I, for some reason, I hadn't asked him before this. I said, what kind of telescope do you have? And he goes, oh, well, I'm saving for a telescope. What? What? Well, you know, our center is regularly getting people calling saying, I've got this telescope sitting in a garage. It's been there for 15 years. Would you like it? And I know you have loaner scopes. This is probably something that your center does too, but we get these. If they're in any kind of condition, we refurbish them and we put them to good use. And I'll show you in a sec. Or maybe we just get the parts that are worth saving and, and junk the rest. But we do things like a library partnership with the Seashell Library where we give them refurbished telescopes so they can loan them out to people. Well, what we did is we decided, okay, we're going to refurbish a telescope. We're going to get a battery charger and batteries. We're going to get all the, the doodads we can together, and we're going to send it to Harry in Uganda. We did that, and here he is with his telescope. Now, the link that I've got on the screen here on YouTube, I did an interview with him, and it's a, a half hour long, so I'm not going to show it to you right now, but if you'd like to meet Harry and, and talk about him and his astronomy, I encourage you to go to the YouTube channel for the Sunshine Coast Center ISC and, and check that out. He is very serious. He, he's a fabulous uh, student of astronomy. He uh, I connected him with the president of CASCA so he could get connected to other black astrophysicists and figure out what he needs to do going forward in his education. Now, this is his sky tonight. This is what it looks like. 
when you look up at the sky. And this is quite a different view from what I've got here at 49 North. So the other thing that we did is we got together a PowerPoint show with five different parts that has all of you need, all you need to know to view the four different seasons for the Messier list to get him started. And we're still in, in contact with him. Now, how about Monmouth, Oregon? We went down there a few years ago. Here is the Eclipsomaniacs. These are members of my center mostly, but there's one center member from the Vancouver Center there, prominently in the, in the, the picture there. And I'll let you figure out which one that is, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. And we all got together for the big eclipse that happened uh, back in 2017. Here we are down in Monmouth in their city park, and we are filming the eclipse. You can see we got one camera, TV camera, with a, a white light filter on the sun. And Brittany there is getting ready to do an interview with me. And we were the only astronomers in the park to see with not expecting someone to come down there and help them with these thousands of people that they had. And we had people from all over the world, literally. There were, it was amazing, some of the places that people come, had come from. But we had our solar scopes there. We had people looking at the eyepiece. As soon as they figured that they could take a picture with one of these iPhones, they were lining up for that as well. And what they were waiting for was this. This is a picture taken by uh, Ed Handler, one of our members. It was an absolutely fabulous event. Now, if you're wondering, how did we get a TV crew involved in this? I've done presentations on this elsewhere, but just briefly, for the last nine seasons, we've been teamed up with Eastlink Television doing a show called Nightlights. The ninth season's coming up this fall, and they put in almost a half a million dollars in, in, of production into this, and it's cost us absolutely nothing. All we have to do is be the hosts and write the scripts, and you can see there we are in the studio with stu uh, student videographers. Uh, it's a fabulous project. We've also teamed up with the Ab uh, Aboriginal People's Television Network, their Coyote Science Show for First Nations Kids Science, and helped them with their astronomical shows. We also did a documentary for Bravo. You know, we got a $50,000 grant from Bravo to do this. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, give me a shout. We can tell you about that. Here's another example of how you can do outreach all over the world. Two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, we started the World Asterisms Project, which is a first attempt to get all of the sky cultures of the world together in one place as a reference for people to use. And when I decided to do this, there were people that, that were absolutely convinced that this wasn't going to happen. There was no way this you could do this. This is just too big a project. Well, asterisms, that's groups of stars in the sky, constellations or official asterisms. It's just a matter of figuring out what people see when they look at that, and because they come from different cultures, different social educational backgrounds, they see different things. For example, if you were at the GA this year, this is one that was created by two of our members, um, Samantha uh, shared this with me. And you can see what they've done here is they've taken four very bright stars in the sky in Leo, in Bootes, and in Virgo, and connected them. They're all double stars. So this is actually what has become the logo for the whole project here. Now, we were inspired to do this by Dave Chapman and Kathy LeBlanc from the Mi'kmaq First Nations because that center got together with those people to help them recover their night skies. They needed to figure out how to use their lunar calendar again and they needed to figure out what constellations they had. And they, this has been phenomenally successful. The RESC has funded making videos on this that you'll find on the national YouTube channel for the RESC. And they now have a fabulous book out, which I would encourage you to, to get. And it's based on the two-eyed seeing concept, which was created by Mi'kmaq El elder Albert Marshall in 2004, where they share their perspectives with our perspectives, and we both come away with them greater perspective, which is of use to all of us. So, so far, we've got 12,871 asterisms, including 437 names of the Milky Way, 200, 2,632 telescopic asterisms, out of 572 sky cultures, and we've added lists of names for the sun, moon, and planets in the Milky Way in there. So the grand total is something like 14,469. Now, 
this was really, really easy to do because two days after I posted online that we were going to attempt to do this project, Dr. Simothy Avalon shows up from Belarus saying, about time somebody did this, let's go. And he is an expert on Belarusian, Eastern European, Central European skies. And you could, this map here is showing you all the different versions of what people see when they look at the Pleiades. He's been sharing all kinds of files with me. The next person checked in the next day was Aki Slotograph, and then is partners, Danella uh, Ramakers and, and so on from the Astronomical Society of Southern Africa. They've shared their entire list of everything that they've got so far. And it wasn't very long before the entire Australian team led by Dr. Dwayne Hamaker joined the, uh, the project and they shared 20 years of research with us. Now I could go on and on and on and give you other examples, but it was really easy to get people to get interested in this and get involved in this. Here's an Australian sky from the Kokapa people. You've got Niruno, who is Orion in, in our skies, who is a hunter, and he wants to get at the Pleiades, who are sisters, but their elder sister, Kambaguda, is saying, no, no, you can't have them. And she's got her dingo puppies out there to protect them. And so he gets angry, and the variable star Betelgeuse starts getting brighter because he's going to throw magic at her. But then Aldebaran starts going brightly because that's her kicking it back at him. <laughs> so here's an example of the kind of sky stories that you can be involved with. This is Dr. Shane P, who is from Inland Sailly. She's from Montana, but he's teaching now at UBC. And he is a partner with our program. And we're in the process of helping him recover Sailly skies. And if you want to hear his address to the uh, society at the GA this year, the link is right on the screen there, or you can go to the National RAC channel. It's fabulous. He's talking about how they view the skies. You can check out these all for yourself for free at this link here. You can just go to Google and put in World Asterisms Project Enter, and it will be the first hit that comes up. And there's a handbook. There is tables, those PDFs and Excel spreadsheets. There is a complete resource list, all of these different things. And this is a living project. This is what my inbox looks like right now. We've been at it for two years, but we're just getting started. So, I mean, if you're interested in getting involved in something like this, give us a show. We have a Google Drive where we share all the files and you can be part of this project. And maybe you've got an asterism that you see up there that you haven't told anybody about. I want to know because we have 2,635 and we definitely want to hear about those because these are other perspectives of the sky. So don't be shy. Now, at this point, we're going to get to that island that I showed you right at the very, very beginning of this presentation, Pitcairn Island. And this is why my colleague Brian Elliott is here with us because he's one of your members and he decided he wanted to go to a dark sky site. And this was the site he chose. And I, it's hard to imagine a site that would be harder to get to, but he went there and, and he did an absolutely fabulous job. I just saw a letter back from the mayor of uh, their uh, fine island there, congratulating them over and over and over again for all the things that he did to help them to develop um, what they're doing there. Now, Pitcairn Island, if you're not sure where that is, here we have a map of the world. You can see the, the islands in the group. There's the, the, the island itself. It's way down here, off in the Pacific, off the west coast of South America. And it is an international dark sky sanctuary, which they call Madaki Taranga, which means eyes to the sky. There's a link there if you want to check it out. This is the IDA's uh, classification. So what I want to do now is ask Brian to uh, to jump in here and tell us about some of his experiences. He has a full presentation that he wants to do for you all later, but he hasn't had a chance to go through all of his pictures yet. So we're just going to do a teaser and show you the kind of stuff that he's been involved in and the kind of outreach you can do in a way, way out place in the world. So you there, Brian? I'm here. Excellent. Love your mask. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, the microphone really does work. So, has anyone actually heard of Pitcairn before tonight? <clears throat> has anybody actually been there? No, this is a 
a little trouble to get to. In case you don't know, if you've read or uh, seen any of the Mutiny of the Bounty stories, that was based on a true story. Um, I did not know it was a true story, but the end of the story is uh, our heroic mutineers end up escaping to an island, and that island is Pitcairn. Um, and my personal belief is that the reason why they were able to safely escape and, and live happily the rest of their lives is because the island is so remote. Um, the last step of it is two nights on a tiny little freighter on the open ocean. Don't forget your seasickness medicine um, <clears throat> to, um, uh, to the island itself. And then they come out in their long boat and fetch you off of the island. Uh, or fetch you off the boat to the island uh, itself. If you're lucky, like I was, then you'll get to see whales playing uh, as you're being uh, taken into the um, uh, into the island itself. Um, just briefly, Pitcairn is actually, well, the Pitcairn Islands is uh, four islands, uh, roughly equidistant between uh, New Zealand and South America. They are uh, the UK's smallest territory and the UK's only territory in uh, the South Pacific. Um, they are strategically located right in the middle of the fourth largest marine protected area in the world. Um, so they have a lot of Marines uh, go visit there every year to uh, study the pristine oceans. And they also have a lot of whales visit there every year to uh, have their young. Um, they're also similarly in the middle of an international dark sky sanctuary that covers all four islands. So it's much bigger than any one island itself. So at 10 p.m., they turn off the electric generators. There's no light pollution whatsoever. So as far as you can see, it is absolutely dark. Um, I was so excited when I found out about this place. I, I emailed them uh, and said, I'm going to come see your, your eyes to the sky. I've never seen a dark sky before. What have you got to go with your dark sky? We have a telescope in the old school. OK. I was expecting a little more than that, but that's okay. I figured I could, at that point, either choose to go someplace else with a more developed astrotourism offering or learn what I needed to learn to be my own sky guide um, when I got there. Um, and obviously, that's what I did, or I wouldn't be up here at the moment. Um, and I figured that if I was going to go through learning all that um, while I was there, I might as well share. because. Uh, Nothing more fun than in sharing something that you're passionate about. <clears throat> so I brought gifts. Um, just in case anybody became interested in the night sky, I wanted to make sure that they had resources there. So I bought them a copy of the Backyard Astronomy's Guide by uh, some of our own RASC members. Uh, I bought them RASC's, um, um, what's it called? <clears throat> ah, Skyways Astronomy Handbook for Teachers. Uh, and I, I, I gave them a, the spectroscopes. Uh, that came with my free membership, uh, that came with my membership from Astronomers Without Borders uh, for their school. So the next time they have kids of an age to go to school, they will, uh, they will be ready to teach that. Um, and I also gave them some, um, some starter um, equipment. Another important thing I did, um, I think, was before I even showed up there, I was in contact with uh, RASC itself. That's how I met Charles. Um, and uh, he pointed me at Astronomers Without Borders. Um, so I contacted them about what I was about to do. And I also contacted UK's Royal Astronomical Society because they are a UK territory. They pointed me to a organization called Dark Sky UK, which sounds perfect for um, a dark sky sanctuary in the UK. So I thought that was good. Um, and I also um, reached out to the International uh, Astronomical Union's Office of Astronomy Outreach. Um, so I had talked to these people, and so when I showed up on the island, um, I was ready to connect these people with uh, whatever, whatever astronomical presence might turn up uh, on the island. Um, I did get to write a letter of introduction at the end. I, that was quite an honor to, uh, to actually do. Um, I want to say this was a lot of teamwork. Obviously, I teamed up with Charles, and I, I talked to all these other organizations. Uh, and while I was on the island, um, I was teamed up with a fellow named uh, Sidney Gould, uh, who, who will be the core of any future astronomical presence there. And we worked with uh, Pitcairn's Island Tourism and uh, worked pretty hard to get ready for what they called the uh, Open Telescope Nights, which I got to host. That was fun. This is me um, <clears throat> talking to the mayor again. 
pointing out Venus, which had just shown up. Um, that is on the island looking south. That is what the whole island looks like on, on the perimeter. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, anyway, teaching the dark sky uh, is awesome. I've never done anything like that ever before. I was nervous as hell. Um, <clears throat> And it went pretty well. Uh, I did figure out some things that you do not do when you're doing something like this. Um, if you're in a dark sky sanctuary, the whole idea is everything is dark. So the carefully prepared handwritten notes that you made is not gonna be very useful. Um, don't do that. Uh, as you saw, we're not on pavement there. And I had the binoculars set up on one side, the telescope set on the other. That's on even ground and people can't navigate that very well in the pitch dark. And if they've never used a Dobsonian uh, telescope like this, they have no way of knowing where to look for the eyepiece in, in the dark. So those didn't work out um, quite so very well. Um, things that did work well, I found, was a lot of naked eye stuff. I mean, as soon as Venus came out, I started there, started answering questions uh, from there going forward, and then the bright stars. Down there, the first two bright stars, stars that come out are the two front hooves of uh, Centaurus. Um, I did not know that until I got down there, which if you follow left, you can uh, you get to show them in Teres, in the middle of Scorpio, and then the teapot in the middle of Sagittarius. Then you can point them back the other direction uh, with um, uh, towards the Southern Cross. Um, those were a little harder to point out. Uh, and so I was kind of pointing to them and they weren't seeing it. And, and uh, so just to make sure uh, that they could really see what's there, I grabbed my green laser pointer and pointed uh, towards it. And everybody gasped simultaneously. It was an amazing sound to hear. Uh, so that was, a, that was a lot of fun. And since my first two telescopes didn't work very well, um, as I was expecting, um, one that worked far better than I was expecting was my go-to telescope, which is this sucker right here, uh, which is in the background of the, the other two uh, uh, pictures. And that worked well because nobody had to move to get to it. Um, I had asked them to bring their binoculars. So I was able to, for instance, point to uh, the jewel box with the green laser pointer and say, and your binoculars here and look for um, jewel box. Uh, and while they were, uh, that then I would try to get this thing to point to it. And that gave him a few minutes to look for it, find it, look at it. Um, then I was able to uh, show them what this thing saw. Uh, so that got them engaged and showed them a much closer view and different ways to see it. And um, that, that really worked well. And it was nice. It, it's, um, it, uses, it doesn't have an eyepiece, it uses the iPad and the picture is constantly getting better as it collects more light. I just handed the iPad to the closest person to say, take a good look, pass it around. And every time this goes around, it's gonna be a slightly better and better picture because it's constantly uh, collecting light. Um, <clears throat> I've been worried about the, uh, the go-to telescope because I didn't know if it'd be considered kind of a cheat because there's no eyepiece, you don't have to aim it yourself. Um, the photons you're actually collecting never hits your own actual retina. Um, but this really convinced me. It, um, for this kind of setting especially, it, um, um, it was one of the stars of the show, actually. So um, <clears throat> uh, I highly uh, recommend something like that. Um, I think you were one of the stars of the show, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just standing there nervous trying to, to fake it like I'm doing right now. Um, you did a valid job. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> when I got back, um, I was thinking about all the stuff that I'd done and was really wondering, you know, how did I do this? Um, I'm just a person. There's 7 billion other persons uh, on the planet, but, but no one else had done this before. Uh, how did I get to be the one to do it? And I thought about it for a while and I came up with one thing that I kept practicing over and over um, that let me go on with it was I just simply did not allow myself to believe that I couldn't do it. Um, and that was, that was my secret. So that's my part of the story. And um, hopefully later, um, I will be able to present the full story because uh, there's a lot more to it. And uh, I'm just really excited about it. It was so much fun. Great place to go if you want a nice remote place to get to and happen to like small freighters. Uh, but other than that, I will pass it back to Charles. Thank you, Brian.
I'm looking forward to the longer presentation because I know you got some family shots. I just want to jump in really quickly. This is the Vespera. I have one too. And uh, I have the same experience using it in outreach. And yes, one of the first things that people say when they look at it is where is the eyepiece? And some people object to the fact that it doesn't have an eyepiece. You know what? This doesn't have an eyepiece. Neither does this. I could sit here for an hour pointing out major telescopes all over the world don't have eyepieces, but I think you get the point. There's mine sitting there on Canada Day. I put the solar filter on it and we could pass around the sun live. So it's a good thing. So what I want to do just to, to wrap this up is just to uh, tell you that one of the things that people on Pitcairn and in other places like Uganda uh, need is equipment. Uh, obviously, we had to send a telescope to Uganda. Obviously, the people at Pitcairn, they've got a couple of telescopes. They've got two eyepieces, no Barlow tube, no filters. They could, the, both of the eyepieces are like six and 11 millimeter. They could use some more wide angle, lower magnification stuff. And as I pointed out earlier, your center, like my center, I'm sure, has people who donate equipment that they no longer need, and you will go out there and find places for it. Well, we got places for it, and we'd like to help them to build up their equipment uh, inventory there on Pitcairn and in other places. So I would encourage you, if you've got some stuff that you would like us to uh, to use for that purpose, get a hold of Brian or get a hold of me, and we'll make sure that it gets to them. And it's very basic stuff. Filters, it's a, a they need 1.25 um, eyepieces. They don't have a Barlow tube. And I want to finish by saying, Brian and I are both members of Astronomers Without Borders. And if you're trying to figure out, well, who could I help out there? Like, where in the world could I go and, and make a difference and do something like this? This is a good place to go and find people who need stuff. because. Here's where they talk about it. They have uh, uh, coordinators in 50 countries all over the world, and they're a very worthwhile organization. And so I'm going to leave it right there and uh, just give anyone a chance to ask questions if they've got them. That's our telescope up at the uh, Sanchenko's Observatory there. If you think of a question later that that once we get going back out there to, to get going at the Trotty Observatory, you absolutely don't hesitate to call me or email me. would be happy to answer any questions that you have. And you can also put them in the chat. I can see that. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll just reiterate here. If anybody in the room has a question they want to ask, uh, because we only have a single microphone and it is a lapel mic, we're going to have to come up here. I don't feel like singing a microphone around the room. Uh, and if anybody in the in the Zoom room wants to ask any questions, please just drop those questions in the chat. Uh, one of the things that I, I always try to prepare myself for the eventuality that there are no questions. Um, these things happen. Uh, and one of the things that I always find interesting um, is asking you know presenters about you know their own personal thing. Right. And so when it comes to like, Charles, I'll start with you when it comes to, you know, collaborating with people, you know, the world over, right, in some sense, um, what has been the most, like, I guess, fulsome part of it all for you? I think that we have to get away from the idea of trying to be the best astronomy club in the, in the, uh, in the, field and, and work on becoming partners with other organizations like Astronomers Without Borders, the Astronomy Society of the Civic. I could go on and on, but we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. And so I think it's really important that we all help each other do that. We all overlap in our responsibilities. And uh, if we work that way, we can achieve much, much more. So uh, I think the thing that has really stood out to me is the willingness of people all over the world to, to do this and to, and to work with people um, elsewhere, wherever they are in the world to, to make this happen. And uh, it's been a very rewarding experience as a result. And just because you're up here, uh, you're the first person I've ever met, Brian, who's ever been to the Pitcairn Islands. Me too. You. <laughs> It'd be, I, I'd be, I honestly, I would be a little bit surprised. Um, what was one thing that absolutely shocked you? That, about about your experience. Shot. 
I'm hard to shock. That that that's a tough question. Um, I think the thing that surprised me was that the mutiny and the bounty was a true story. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, it's the first tropical subtropical island that I'd ever been to. Uh, it's the first time I'd ever gone to the southern hemisphere. Um, I had never been on an island that before. It's up. It, it approaches five square kilometers. It is not big. Uh, <clears throat> going there and seeing, I, first time I saw a palm tree with, with actual coconuts hanging on it, the sheer beauty of it just blew me away. I mean, the, they've got the dark sky sanctuary, but they've got so much more than just that. Uh, during the day, I just spent as much time as I could hiking because the whole thing was just was just amazing. And, and every time I close my eyes now, I'm reliving some of those hikes and whatnot. It was just glorious. How did you actually get there? How did I get there? Um, it was a long trip. Um, <clears throat> from uh, Basically what you do is fly to Tahiti, which I'd also never been to before. Um, from there, you take a four hour flight to a tiny little island that I had never heard of before and don't remember it saying, oh, Mangareva. Um, from there, you get on a tiny little freighter um, that takes up to 12 passengers. That's it. Um, <clears throat> and you enjoy two nights on the open ocean. I mean, you're literally out in the middle of nowhere. There's no land uh, all around. And that was my first experience with the Southern Dark Sky, actually. I was, uh, I'd go up to a dark spot on the deck uh, and look up and was just stunned. It was the first time I'd seen the piercing, brilliant sky, uh, stars in an absolutely dark sky. I mean, here they're fuzzy, they're vague. Uh, you, you don't see most of them, but that was just, it's the way it's supposed to be, but it seemed completely unreal to me because I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, and then from there, they come in the long boat uh, and get you. And that island has approaching 50. I think right now they've got about 45 permanent residents and usually at least 10 of them are off the island at any one time. So all of their residents came to the dock to greet us when we we're up there. So you got to meet everyone all at one time. <laughs> Um, it's very cool. And it's the reverse process just to get back up. It took me two days to get there. And I was there in the same time zone as us. It was just 8,200 kilometers south uh, from us. But even though I didn't change time zones, I felt severely jet lagged just from the whole, uh, uh, just from the whole trip. Mm -hmm. I, I see that Gordon Carroll has got a question in the chat, Andrew. He says, the Coast Salish people can be very private about their stories. Have you had any success reaching out to them for their asters? And yes, it's taken a great deal of patience and hard work to get over all of the things that, that the mistrust naturally that rose out of that awful residential school experience that they uh, went through. But we have. Um, one of the the indications that we're making some progress in that area is that we've got Dr. Sheen and Pete working with us now because he is Salish, inland Salish, but he's helping all of the Salish people uh, put together their skies. So um, yes, we now have pretty good idea of, of some of them. Um, some of them we're still trying to nail down. It's a process of going through these stories with the elders and trying to identify exactly what they mean when they are describing something in the sky. Uh, it's the sort of thing that the Halifax Center went through with the Mi'kmaq, but we're, we're making great progress. And the Asterisms Project is helping because we're giving them ideas of what other nations and other people uh, saw when they look up there and it, it helps them to put this together. So uh, happy to say, yes, we're, we're, we're doing this. It's It's, Important also to recognize that it's my job as an astronomer to tell you about the stars, and it is the knowledge keeper's job to tell you this story. So in these handbooks that we put out in the World Asterisms Project, we tell you there is a story, but if you want the story, we're creating resources, that resources I talked to you about, so you can go to the people themselves, and they can tell you the story because it's theirs to tell. Uh, yeah, here. Question for you. Um... When we do visual imaging, uh, our equipment requires power. Talk a little bit about how you have, have a power. Did you have a solar charge your equipment? Was there AC available to charge, like solar remote? How did you handle all that? Okay. Um, 
for the sake of Zoom, I'll repeat the question. Um, how are it when you're out in the field is a problem. Um, how did I handle in this particular case? This thing holds a pretty large charge, as a matter of fact. Um, I They've got UK power, so I had to have bring converters with me. But I just charged it during the day, and it was ready for me to go uh, at night. Um, everything else that I needed was either manual, like the binoculars or the Dobsonian, um, or I had batteries. Um, I would make sure that everything was charged up. So batteries in very various different forms, but at least during the day, they had the generators going. Uh, so you had regular AC power over there. That was an issue for Harry in Uganda as well. He uh, knew that he, we were sending him a, a go-to telescope, but batteries are hard to get a hold of. So we sent him rechargeable batteries and a recharger with a plug that goes into their system. So that's something you need to be uh, aware of if you're planning to do something like that. Yeah, I'm just wondering how much is the telescope? Um, how much is the telescope? This is the Veonis Vespra. Um, since I bought it, it has severely gone down in price because they have just announced a Vespera Pro that you can pre-order. So what I paid for it is more than their current asking price. Um, I think it's in US, I think it's listed in US dollars, uh, 1500. 1500 and then accessories, uh, you can get different filters for it. Uh, I got the solar filter. So because in downtown Gastown, I can see one star, it's the sun. So I was gonna make sure that I could see it. Um, and they've got some uh, others and I bought the backpack for it just because it was uh, easier. So it, it, it was kind of a splurge. And if I didn't have a uh, upcoming trip where I wanted to try to impress them, then uh, I probably wouldn't have done it yet. Any other questions from here in the room? Yeah, at the back. <laughs> um, the question was, am I gonna have a second presentation on this? This was just kind of a, a, a teaser, uh, which I found out all two days ago. So <laughs> I'm so nervous, <clears throat> but I was already planning on uh, putting together a presentation with a lot more information about this and um, we'll work <clears throat> to figure out when that will be obviously not next month because <laughs> we're on break because we're on break which is great uh and so if they want me in two months i can but i don't know what their plans uh, are so yes absolutely um once i get going about this it's hard to stop me so how much time you got <laughs> yeah i i dragged him into this because i knew that he had a lot of good material here and and uh, we could do an intro for that presentation and it fit perfectly into the sort of thing that we're trying to put across tonight. So uh, someone's asking how many people live on the small island dark sky sanctuary? I think you, you just answered that, Brian. In the case of Pitcairn, I, I don't think it's the only island uh, in a dark sky sanctuary, but in the case of Pitcairn, they have a permanent residency of approaching 45 people. Um, and at any one time, there's usually 10 or so off the island because um, the more advanced medical stuff, they have to get take this two-day boat ride to go to the dentist, for, in, for instance. So um, not, not a lot of, uh, lots of reasons that they have to leave on a, uh, on a regular basis. Um, I forgot what the rest of the thing I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna go on. <laughs> I was just, I was doing a head count while I was here and combining the Zoom room with our in-person, I think we outpopulate Pitcairn yeah, Island. So, do. so there's that. And with regards to future presentation, my people will contact your people. And by that, I mean, I will contact you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're you. all, we're all our own people. Uh, I'll put out one more final call for questions from here in the room. If anybody has anything they want to say, yeah. Yeah, so we're, uh, the question was, uh, could you define what a sky culture is? Okay, well, people all over the world are looking at the same stars that you are, but because they come from different backgrounds, they see something different. And, and this is the, the major point of the Inclusivity and Diversity Committee uh, creating this project in the first place is to really clearly demonstrate to you how this how this works. And um, it's it's amazing how how different things could be, uh, you know, even in the same country. You'll you'll have, for example, in Italy, you know, there's the official IAU constellations we all know. But if you go off into 
the countryside and you talk to farmers, you talk to people who are raising cattle and stuff, they have a quite different view of what's up there because it fits into their calendar and how they do things. And this is true all over the world. So um, this is about uh, exploring people's perspectives and, and uh, celebrating it. And um, like I said, we got a long ways to go because there are something like 7,000 world languages and we've only got 570 cultures so far. But um, it's important that we try and save these perspectives too because elders are passing and with them, the knowledge is going. And if their later generations uh, want access to this, we need to move on as quickly to, to make sure that we uh, recover this. But uh, it's it's been a very productive project so far, and we're looking forward to, to continuing with it. All right, I'd seeing nothing else pop into the chat here, I'm happy to finish the Q&A part of the presentation. Oh, want to say one more thing? yeah, of course. So regarding this thing, uh, I I tend to come to the Starry Nights here that are on every clear um, uh, every clear Friday night. Right now, I think they're starting at ten. Um, yay, Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, on Pitcairn, I broke my binoculars because the wind blew them over. So I will be bringing this thing um, and uh, practicing using it. If anybody wants to come and see what uh, what it's actually like. <clears throat> Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you, Brian, for coming in person here. And thank you, Charles, for taking the time to uh, My pleasure. To at us. It's always appreciated.